Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and good night everyone. Uh, today is March 9th, 2023 and we have approximately 12 days until the month of Ramadan. Thank you for tuning in. If you're on here, please share the live, share, share, share. We want everybody to benefit from our lecture tonight. Okay, so for those who don't know who I am, my name is Sister Mukhtara, and I am the founder of Bambar, which is Black American Muslims Born and Raised. Alhamdulillah, we founded it in 2020. And this program is our third year. And this program is called Bambar's Pre-Ramadan Series, where we get uh, the people that's virtual to, uh, you know, get us in the spirit of Ramadan, get us prepared for fasting, et cetera. So I pray that the programming that we're doing here is a benefit to everyone, inshallah. So tonight we have a special guest, Imam Rashad Abdul Rahman, mashallah. He is one of the imams at Atlanta Mashtip, Al Islam. And he will be giving a talk tonight, inshallah. Um, for those who were a little confused, he was supposed to give a lecture Monday, but alhamdulillah, we're here now, <laughs> mashallah, alhamdulillah. And tonight we also have a special guest reciter from the Bain Bar Youth, mashallah. Uh, for those who don't know, Ashir Kirk from Measure Tones, his daughter Rumaysa is here tonight and she will be reciting for us a little bit, mashallah. And we have also our good brother Bilal Hassan who will be introducing um, Imam Rashad. So without further delay, um, I am going to read uh, Rumaysa's bio, inshallah. Give me one second. Uh, let me see. Okay. Rumaysa Kirk is an 11-year-old third-generation African-American student of Quran. She was born in Atlanta, Georgia, but currently resides in Memphis, Tennessee, with her parents, Majida Haygood and Asher Kirk, founder of Measured Tones Institute of Quran. Rumaysa studied Quran in Senegal, West Africa for one year while studied at the AAII African American Islamic Institute uh, Academy in Medina by Kaulak. There, she memorized almost five juz of Quran under Ustad Muhammad Diop. She continued her Quranic studies privately with Ustad Khawla Bensalm from Algeria in Arabic studies with Ustad Sara Moyden from Morocco. Rumaysa speaks two languages, English and Wolof, and is working on her third, Arabic, mashallah. She will be reciting for us Surat al-Muzammil and war style of recitation, inshallah. Shukran Rumaysa for being here, alhamdulillah, and you can, you can start. Alhamdulillah, <laughs> أوزد عليه ورتل القرآن ترتيلا إنا سنلقي عليك قولا ثقيلا إن ناشئة الليل هي أشد وطأ وطأ وأقوى مقيلا إن لك في النهر سبحا طويلا واذكر اسم ربك وتبتل إليه تبتيلا رب المشرق والمغرب لا إله إلا هو فاتخذه وكيلا واصبر على ما يقولون واهجرهم هجرا جميلا ودرني والمكذبين أولي النعمة ومهلهم قليلا إن لدينا أنكالا وجحيما وطعاما ذا غصة وعذابا نليما 
يوم ترجف الأرض والجبال وكانت الجبال كثيبا مهيلا إنا أرسلنا إليكم رسولا شاهنا عليكم كما أرسلنا إلى فرعون رسولا فعصى فرعون الرسول فأخذناه أخذا وبيلا فكيف تتقون إن كفرتم يوما يجعل الولدان شيبا السماء منفطر به كان وعده مفعولا إن هذه تذكرة فمن شاء اتخذ إلى ربه سبيلا إن ربك يعلم إن ربك يعلم أنك تكون أدنى من سلسي الليل ونصفه وثلثه وطائفة من الذين معك والله يقدر الليل والنهار علم أن لن تحصلوا فتاب عليكم فقرأوا ما تيسر من القرآن علم أن سيكون منكم مرضى وآخرون وآخرون يضربون في الأرض يبتقون من فضل الله وآخرون يضربون في الأرض يبتقون وآخرون يقاتلون في سبيل الله فقرأوا ما تيسر منه وأقيموا الصلاة وآتوا الزكاة وأقلدوا الله قرضا حسنا وما تقدموا لأنفسكم من خير تجدوه عند الله هو خير وأعظم أجرا واستغفر الله إن الله غفور رحيم صدق الله العظيم ما شاء الله شكران رميسة ما شاء الله you did great الحمد لله and Allah continue to bless you الحمد لله so next we have our brother Bilal Hassan, and he will be introducing Imam Rashad, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa ta'ala wa barakatuh. Um, I have the honor and privilege to introduce Imam Rashad Abdul Rahman of the Atlanta Masjid al-Islam. Um, one of my, uh, my teacher actually, third year in his Quran study and leadership institute program. For, he'll talk more about that, but definitely check that program out for sure. Um, and he has some free classes open to the public coming up for Ramadan focused on Surah Tal Imran, which is open to everyone. I'm sure he'll share more information about that. So we're going to read his short bio, short and sweet. Uh, Imam Rashad is the assistant imam of the Atlanta Masjid Al Islam. He studied for four years directly under Imam Warafuddin Muhammad, Rahimullah, Quranic Arabic, Tafsir, Islamic Studies, and Comparative Religions. Um, he studied Usul al-Din at the Medina Institute, Arabic, Akita Fiqh, Ulum ul-Quran, Ulum ul-Hadith, Logic, and Usul ul-Fiqh. Studied philosophy and comparative religions at Northern Illinois University, University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee as well. He's currently pursuing an ijazah in, taj in Tajweed and Ten Kirat at Critical Loyalty and the founder of the Institute of Quran Study and Leadership, an institution devoted to the study sciences of the Quran with a special emphasis on the tafsir of Imam Warfuddin Muhammad. He is the author of The Message of Islam, The Foundations of Al-Islam, and Black Suffering and the Sacred Rights of Man in Islam, which is forthcoming. So without no further ado, Imam Rashad Abdurrah Rahman. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, we begin Bismillahi Rahmani Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Was salatu was salamu ala Rasulihi al Kareem. Muhammad wa ba'd. Uh, before beginning, I want to make a couple of statements. First of which is really a um, a salute to uh, in to to the sister in the family of the young sister. I know Ustad Ashir. Uh, he was one of my teachers uh, and still is. I think my children are still in measured tones and my wife as well. Uh, so we salute him, his wife, uh, for the work that they are doing to really establish uh, the knowledge of the Quran uh, here in America and, and abroad. 
Um, and it's really beautiful to see uh, the fruits of the type of work that persons such as he do with his, with his daughter. And I know that that's an interest for a lot of us as parents to have our children embrace the Quran at a young age. Uh, and our prayer for them is to fall in love with the Quran. And we also want for them to become, uh, was, was, as is given in our tradition, Ahlul Quran, the people of the Quran, inshallah. So that's our prayer. Um, <clears throat> the second thing I would like to do is really salute the team or the staff of the bambar of this, of this platform. Um, I try to keep up with the conversations and things. I don't chime in much. I try to keep up with, with what is said and the discussions that go on, but I salute you all. And I, and I see a lot of events, some events that you all put on have planned. And I think that this is just a very good effort. Um, and I'm happy. I'm pleased. I should say to be back for this sort of pre Ramadan uh, presentation. Uh, so I'm going to, I don't know how long this will be. I, I won't try to be that long, um, but I do, I missed the the Monday night and the hosts were gracious enough to allow me um, uh, this opportunity here. As a matter of fact, the reason why I was late because of a, a, a situation with my wife's travel, she was actually coming back from a Quran uh it was a sister's, African-American sister's Quran program, something of that nature. And I do believe that Ustel Ashir's wife was also there. Um, so this is a beautiful thing that's occurring. That's why, that's why I'm citing that. That's why I couldn't make it. But it's a beautiful thing that's occurring with us as a people. Uh, the history says that 20 to 40 percent, and I actually believe that it's more for certain reasons, but that's another, that's another conversation. 20 to 40% of the, of the slave Africans brought here and made slaves uh, came from Islamic land, Islamic culture. Um, and we believe, we have been taught to really understand that Al-Islam is our sacred heritage. We were not off, we were taken away from Islam and what we were offered as our life in America was Christianity. And it was real. It's not the Christianity or it's not the teachings of Prophet Isa, alayhi salam, the, the real prophet. Uh, uh, it's the deformity that had taken shape on the continent of Europe and the deformity that had taken place in the theology of the Europeans and the 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 the, the, the I would say the most potent component of that deformity was the presentation of a God in the image of a white man. Uh, many of us, we're African-American. We've seen that image, not just on television or somewhere distant from us. We've actually seen that image in the homes of our family members. We've seen it in churches, so on and so forth. So we were denied what really we understand as our inheritance, inheritance, which is Islam. And we thank Allah for our presence here today as a, not here this night, but I'm saying in this time where we are really, Allah, highly glorified as he, he is blessing us to come back into uh, our, our original life, our true life, which is the life of Muslims. Um, so the topic for this evening is perfecting worship. Uh, that's the, the title that was given and I selected it. I want to make clear at the outset though, that for us, nothing is perfect in the absolute sense. From an Islamic perspective, no entity or no thing or being is perfect except for Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, highly glorified is he, above any imperfection. That's what that means. Um, However, there is what we could say is a relative perfection. We are relatively perfect in so much as we make our intentions correct. Um, so perfection is not in performance, but in intention. The intentions of the person really connects to the spirit. If our intention is to please our Lord, if it's to please Allah, then our spirit will be the same. And it's the spirit that's really the strongest force in the life of the human being. The spirit is even more powerful than the intellect. The spirit is more powerful than the heart. The spirit influences the totality of the being of man. So when our prophet, prayers and peace be upon him said, 
Surely actions are by intentions. And surely for every person or man, what he intends. He highlighted the significance uh, of intent, obviously, but there's different discussions around what that first expression means, and one of the uh, understandings is that that statement is not just a statement to be looked at from a, a legal lens that God is going to, we, try, we, we, we tend to say actions are judged by intention, but that judged is added in there when they translate it in English. One of so one of the understandings of the of the Arabic is that the nature of the human being himself as he's created is that how he acts is based upon the state of his intentions, the state of his heart and ultimately the state of his of his uh, spirit. So. We want to really enter in the month of Ramadan with a certain intention, a certain spirit a certain direction, a certain focus, a certain aim for a certain purpose. And we really, as Allah says, he says it very plainly. Well, this is really a, a Hadith Qudsi. The Prophet said, uh, but he's Hadith Qudsi, we know the nature of it, where it's as if God is speaking in the first person, but it's not revelation at the level of the Quran. He says, fasting is for me. Which, if we stop right there, there's much uh, to the Hadith. As a matter of fact, he says, all of the acts of the sons of Adam are for him, but fasting is for me, and I give reward for it. So this really sets the tone for how we should approach the month of Ramadan. We should know that the whole month, our aim, our intent is to be for our Lord. What does that mean? We are engaging in the discipline the disciplines pardon me of the month simply because if we look at it just on the surface simply because Allah commanded this of us and our will our spirit is to obey our Lord in an absolute way there's a lot to be said about that but that's the intention that we are to have when we enter into this particular time but let's connect this now to the idea of worship. This, this, this notion that our intent is to be right, our intent is to, is to fast for God, knowing that God gives the direct reward. Let's look at this now with this topic of worship. Allah, he says in the Quran, a verse that many of us are familiar with, وَمَا خَلَقَتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ And I have not created the jinn nor the human being except for my worship. The verb, ya'budun. The noun that we most of us are familiar with is uh, ibadah. It's like a verbal noun, really. And the one doing the ibadah is the abd. So we really have the, the, the work to serve God. That's why we're created. We serve God through acts of worship, acts of service. And we ourselves are servants or slave, but slave is a little harsh. I was explaining this at, at a program for the master the other day. Language, when it's translated, not only do we want to know what the word just means in its historical use in its original language, but sometimes term uh, the, the, the language that you're translating into, sometimes you have, you have to take into account the spirit and the feel of the language that you're translating into. And in American, in, in America, in American English, the word slave is very harsh in its feel because of the shameful history of slavery that we have endured, uh, that, we, that our foreparents endured. And because we want to translate something from the Quran or certain meanings that Allah communicates to our Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and through him to us, we don't want any ugliness to the, to the best of our, uh, to the best, to, to, to it, uh, as far as possible. We don't want any of the ugliness of the feeling of English to influence or affect how we understand what Allah communicates. So the term slave is a bit harsh, therefore servant is more preferred. But it's understood now that this term worship and servant are interchangeable. But a servant, 
even if we could just for a split second, think of the term slave. The term servant implies a worker. And many of you all, if you, you know, if you, if you, if you tune into the Atlanta Masjid or you've been a, a part of our courses, you're familiar with uh, this, this uh, focus that I, that I take on that, on this verse, that the servant is the worker. God created man to worship him. God created man to serve him. Allah, highly glorified is he. And Allah created man to work for him. But what this means is not that the man is doing something that Allah needs. He is above need. He is as samad He is al ghani not in need of anything for anything, yet everything is in need of him for everything. But what it means is that the man is created to work and serve according to the command of God, the command of Allah. He is to obey the command of Allah, obey the will of Allah. And in so much as he does that, that is the, the degree to which he is serving his Lord. So understanding the idea of service, ibadah, in this focus, we, want, we ask the question and what brings us to the question of where do we see or where do we find the work, the service that Allah created the human being to do. He says he created man to serve him. So where do we see this service or this work played out or acted out is a better word than play. It's given in the actual ayah. I have not created. So if we simply look at the very creation of man, we see the human being established in the role of worker, of servant, of worshiper of Allah. Highly glorified is he. The first man, Adam. Allah, he says, Inni khaliqum. Surely I am creating a mortal, a bashar. From sounding clay. Min sol salim, min hama im masnoon. From sounding clay, they translate it. From mud fashioned into shape. God says khaliq, meaning that this creature that's coming into the earth over time, over a process, God is, for, is, 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 is forming him in the world. And to cut through a lot of language, to get really straight to the point, I'm going to make two big jumps. And I'm sure that uh, you all who are students uh, of the religion, uh, uh, it, it, will, it won't be too much. The, the jump won't be, won't be anything at all. You, you'll be able to follow. I'm, I'm, I'm jumping to save time. We know that Allah created the first man and he gave the first man the responsibility to cultivate the garden. The first work that the man was assigned to was the work of cultivating the garden and feeding from the garden. Allah commands him to eat from the garden, dwell you and your wife in the garden and eat from it. But the understanding is that the, the, what, what the man is eating from are the fruits born or, or, or that, that are coming out of the garden. And there's a lot to be said on this. But again, I'm going to make a second, a, 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 a jump, a jump really quick, uh, not really quick, but just a jump to, to get straight to the point. It is understood when we consider the question of the garden for man. There's a garden that he exists in before the world. There's a garden that he exists in at the conclusion of the world. Inshallah, we all want to reach Jannah. That's our, that's our work. That's a part of why we worship in the, after this life is concluded. And it's also understand, understood by the learned in this religion that the garden is also present in this life that we live. The garden of the human being in this life is in the soul. Hence, Allah, he says, Qad aflaha man, man zakaha. Speaking of the soul, indeed, he is successful who purifies it. And some even translate it as cultivates it because they understand the, the nature of this discussion that the soul itself is like a garden that is to be cultivated. Hence, the word aflaha. Or the eflaha. This eflaha connects to, for example, when we say in our prayer, the adhan actually, hayya al-falah. After hayya al-salah, 
come to the prayer. Hayya ala al-falah, come to success. In the Arabic language, a falah is a farmer. So there are many words for success, even in the Quran. But this particular word, from this, this particular term, it implies the success that is reached after the cultivation. This is the success like the, the, the farmer in his agricultural work, after he has a good harvest, he has a great harvest. He has great growth coming out of the earth and he's able to collect the fruit, benefit from the fruit in a multitude of ways or from the vegetation, whatever form it may be. And Allah, he says, Qad The believers are successful. And he describes those in their salat, in their prayer, they have this khushur, as we say, uh, uh, in our tradition. And he goes through various steps. So these are the steps of bringing the, this is, he's describing why the believer is successful. He gives, uh, he, he avoids vain talk. He gives in charity. He protects his sexual organs, so on and so forth. And in following these disciplines, he is cultivating the soul. So the soul is the field of activity for the worker. It's not the only field. There's much to be said about this because even the home, when we marry our wives, when we marry our husbands, when we raise our children, all of these are areas that we are assigned to really to cultivate and see to it that we have beautiful, luscious growth occurring. But the question becomes, if we accept the notion that in the very soul of every human being, there is the seed or there are the seeds for the growth of the garden, the question becomes, how do we bring about that growth? And this is really one of the, 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 the ways or one of the places in which we see the interchange between the meaning, between the meaning of servant and worship or worship her. Because it is by way of, of ibadah as worship, in the sense of ritual worship, that we cultivate our own soul. When I say ibadah, I'm speaking specifically now of the life of ritual worship and spiritual devotion. The whole life of the Muslim is to be lived cultivating the soul. And it's the month of Ramadan, Shahru Ramadan, that really gives us an opportunity to increase in the worship so that we develop our souls more and more and more. So, for example, Buni al Islam al al Khams. Al Islam is built upon five. And we have the five pillars of our religion that we are all, or most of us, if not all, are familiar with. And all of these are disciplines for the development of our spirituality. But let's zero in specifically on the month of Ramadan. We know that the definition, like from a legal perspective, of the fast is to abstain from food, from drink, from lawful engagement with our spouses, from Fajr until Maghrib, sunset, with intention. Most say with intention. Uh, I don't think the Hanafis do. But that's, that's, that's another discussion. But in general, all actions are by intention, but uh, with intention. I intend to fast. We make the intention to fast the month of Ramadan. We make the intention in the night, either while breaking the fast or before the night is, is, is over, has concluded, before the next day comes. That's the general definition. But we know that our prophet, prayers and peace be upon him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that the one who is fasting shouldn't even, is, he is not to, or she is not to, utter speech that is immodest. So the higher meaning that many speakers speak about, the higher meaning or the higher associations with the fast include even the fasting of the tongue, because if I'm not to utter speech that is unbecoming while I'm fasting, then that is saying then very clearly, actually, that my tongue is also under the discipline of fast. And really, the tongue reveals the mind. We say what's on our mind. 
but what's on our mind really reveals our heart. So fasting progresses then. The notion of fasting or the meaning of fasting, it goes beyond just the abstention from the food and the drink and the lawful engagement with our spouses, so on and so forth, to our tongue. Now, you can actually have a tongue that you control, yet still have uh, uh, thoughts that are unbecoming. And you can still have your, you be correcting your thoughts, but you still have certain desires or passions come up in you and you have to check them. So what we are given as sort of wisdom really is, is, is spiritual discipline for the purification of our whole self and is wisdom from the prophet in this statement is that our tongue, our mind, our heart is also to be brought under the discipline of fasting. So in other words, the whole self should be given to God. And what this really does, it empties us out. We empty out our own mind. We empty out our own whims, our own inclinations. We empty out our ego. You know, when the gardener has, to, has, a, has a interest to plant something for growth, the first thing that he has to do is clear the soil. He pulls up the weeds. He has to turn over the soil. They have to, what they call irrigate, I think the term is. They have to actually let air get into it. They have to open up the soil. So in the day of the fast, we are restraining from the first category of things that we are restraining from, the food, the drink, the lawful intercourse. These are actually lawful things for us. In other, in, in another way to put that is that these are things that our own fitrah demands of us. It's natural. It's a natural thing in the human being to be hungry and get something to eat, to be thirsty and get something, th something to drink, to have a, a sense of attraction or a pull on our mates and want to engage them. These are natural inclinations of the flesh, and they are pure in and of themselves. But during this month, we are even restricting those things that are lawful for us and natural for us for the obedience of God. So obviously the principle of obedience is very, is very strong. And as I mentioned at the outset, obedience is really what connects us or it brings us to purification. That's during the day. And then during the day, we are restraining from bad thoughts. We are restraining from speaking in a wrong way. And really we can continue this. And I'll speak about this momentarily. We don't even, not only do we, do we want to refrain from speaking, negatively but we want to stay away from negative speech we want to stay away from negative minds negative spirit like nowadays they say energy but it means spirit you feel something that's bad you want to avoid that we are doing this throughout the day and this is really an emptying out of the ego emptying out the self from the self for not from for one of a better way of putting it because all of us we are our own individual selves but all of us in our own individual selves require, we need more refinement. We need more improvement. We need more betterment. But the discipline that's established in the tradition of our prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is that in the night, we are consuming, we are filling ourselves up with, we are engaging, or like I said, if we're emptying out during the day, we're filling ourselves up with in the night, the Quran. We can read our Quran during the day. We can have the Quran playing, but the intentional established practice of the Muslims is to have the Salatul Tarawih in the night where we are attempting to complete the entirety of the Quran. And after all, we know the hadith regarding the angel Jibreel coming to the prophet, prayers and peace be upon him, in the month of Ramadan to review it. And in the last year of the prophet's life, he came and reviewed it twice with him. We know that Shahru Ramadan is the month in which the Quran was revealed, so on and so forth. So the, Quran, the month of Ramadan is the month of the Quran. But the emphasis on the Quran in the month of Ramadan is primarily in the night. Surely we have revealed it or sent it down in the night of, of, of power. I was translated. And God says, uh, 
Laylatan Mubaraka, a blessed night. So the night. So we lose, we lose a little bit more sleep. We strain ourselves. We condition ourselves to be filled up. And you all know this is a, a common experience. You know, you're not eating all day. And you reach a point in the month of Ramadan where you're not even or we're not even hungry. You know, it's, it's just the, 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 there's there's a, uh, our, our appetite decreases. So. What is this to do? We're conditioning our behavior, we're emptying out ourselves of our normal habits, our weaknesses, our whims, etc. And then we are filling ourselves up with the word of God so that we become more conscious of the word of Allah, so that we become more aware of it, more sensitive to it, etc. This is to sensitize us and bring us closer and closer to the form or the model of the abd that Allah wants for created all of us to be in. And we know that the, 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 the prophet himself is the model, the ideal abd, abdullah, that's the highest title. So increasing our work, perfecting our worship, increasing our worship. As this month, when we enter into this month, I have really general suggestions for all of us. And this is really to conclude in light of that sort of broad structure that we, we just addressed. I suggest this is what I do in my home and I find it to be very beneficial. In the manner of emptying ourselves, turn off the television, please. Turn off the social media, unless you're on Bambar having high, you know, what they call high edified discussions about the month. But turn off all of these devices and gadgets and doohickeys, whatever they call them, that are separated from devotion to Allah. You have to unplug. We make an extra effort to make our prayer, our salat on time. We want to be more vigilant even in our sunnah, our, our sunnah prayers, our extra prayers. As I mentioned, especially for a lot of sisters, a lot of you all, you all are, like I watch my wife. She's handling a lot of things in the home. I saw my mother do it growing up. So even if you have the Quran and you can listen to it, if you're going shopping and things like that. But if, if you can read the Quran, definitely read it. Uh, even if it's so much as a page, but have the Quran every day. I make, I would even suggest, and I, I, I'm, I'm suggesting to you not only what I've read from other learned people, but I'm, I'm, I don't suggest things that I haven't done. I don't like saying, oh, this scholar said this and I haven't done it. That's not really, you know, that's like me telling, hey, let's take this vacation because my friend went, but I never went. I don't know. But I've actually done these things. And I'm telling you, this, 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 you will experience the beauty of this month. Uh, the extra dua. Dua is, a, and remember in the series of ayat, the verses where God is speaking, uh, revealing about Ramadan, that's in one of the verses where he says, when my servant asks you concerning me, he doesn't say, tell them I am near. They, they put it like that in the translation, but the, Allah says, when, they, when my servant asks you concerning me, I am near. So this is sort of a rhetorical device, establishing to us directly. So he doesn't say, tell them I am near. It, it's it doesn't say, tell them I am near, really conveying and emphasizing the, the fact that we don't have an intermediary between us and Allah. He just says, I am near. And I respond to the call of the caller when he calls on me, but let him respond to my call. So increase dua during this month. If you can set out a particular time of the day, all the better. I try to, I really encourage to make more adhkar. The best of the dhikr, dhikrs is la ilaha illallah. If you can do 100 a day, that's really good. If you can do 300, if you can do 500, if you can do 1,000, that's really, really good. Um, the benefits can't be, it's like in Islamic tradition. I can't tell you what honey tastes like. You have to taste it and then you'll know. The benefit is, 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 uh, is guaranteed though. Sending extra prayers upon the prophet. We know that this is given to us. We are, we are offered this. We are invited to do this in the Quran. 
Uh, but again, I say the same thing. 100, 300, 500, 1,000. Try your best. If you could take a half hour out of the day and the night is a good time. Um, and definitely, definitely, I would say, observe the last 10 nights. Hold to those last 10 nights. Observe the whole month. But making an effort for Tarawih, even if you are by yourself, let's say you're in a situation where you don't have a community with an open masjid, do it in your home. Remember, the prophet did it in his home. It was established. Omar established this uh, as a thing, how we have it today, as a practice that we have today. And we tend to do it as a congregation. But it's, 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 that was a good innovation. That was a necessary innovation. But it's equally good and valid to do it on your own, even if you can make two, two uh Rakat, even if you, you know all you know is ahad, do something. And after you do those two rakat, that's when you go into your dua, asking Allah to bless you to learn more of the Quran, to become closer to Him. Uh, so that's really what, what I have. But, but you have to unplug, though. It's very hard in this world. There, there's so many attractions uh, for us. But this American society, not the political structure so much as the culture. The culture is really desired, designed, pardon me, to pollute us. It's a, it's a strong pollutant or it has a lot of toxins. Like we talk about a lot about tox toxicity, but most of the toxicity comes from American culture. So let us get the benefit of this month. Uh, and with that, I pray Allah, I pray that Allah uh, bless us with success. I, I pray that he first bless us to reach the month of Ramadan. And I pray that he bless us with a successful fast. And he bless us with the opportunity to get the benefits of this month, inshallah. Uh, and with that, I will conclude. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you, Imam Rashad. I want to say uh, we really appreciate you. This is the second year that you came on and uh, been a part of our pre-Ramadan series. So I just really want to say thank you so much. Thank you. Um, may Allah bless you, Amen. inshallah. And so for everybody that's tuning in, we, our next one is uh, on Monday, inshallah. We have the assistant Imam of Masjid Safat in Baltimore. Uh, Musa Abdurrahman, he will uh, be on Monday, inshallah. So tune in that then, inshallah. Uh, thank you again. And inshallah, I will see you guys later. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs>